This is the Digging for Truth podcast, presented by the Associates for Biblical Research, demonstrating the historical reliability of the Bible through archaeological and biblical research. Have you ever wondered or asked questions about the composition of the Bible? Like, why does it have 66 books? And why those 66 books and maybe not some other ones? And how come there's so many translations? Well, those questions and more are addressed in a book called Scribes and Scripture, the amazing story of how we got the Bible. And it has a lot of answers to common questions about the writing, copying, canonizing, and translation of the Bible. It's co-written by Dr. John Mead and Dr. Peter Gurry. And Henry Smith got a chance to talk with Dr. Mead about the book and a bunch of these questions. Dr. Mead is a professor of Old Testament and a co-director of the Text and Canon Institute at Phoenix Seminary. Here's Henry. Hey, John. (laughs) How are you, brother? All right, man. How are you? I'm excellent. All right. So we're going to kind of jump in uh, on this book, Scribes and Scripture. Yeah. That you have co-authored with your colleague, uh, Peter Gurry, Dr. Peter Gurry. You you guys begin the book of this story I'd never heard before about this woman named uh, Mary Jones and how we sort of take what we think about having access to the Bible today compared to just a couple centuries ago. Yeah, that's right. So Mary's uh, just a a wonderful figure. Of course, not much is said about her, known about her. I don't think she uh, lived a life, you know, that was, uh, that she would have thought worthy to be mentioned in in books. You know what I mean? Uh, Mary just was kind of ordinary. But uh, in the 1800s, She's a she's a Welsh gal, and uh, has this burning desire to to have like a, a copy of the Bible uh, in her own language, in her own in her own hands. Um, you know, we we tell a little story about how she would walk you know long distances to try to to try to actually have the Bible in her hand. These sorts of things. We stumbled upon her story um, because the United Bible Society or the British uh, Bible Society actually uses her as an exa- as the kind of the historical uh, inspiration for what they went on to do and that was to try to produce bibles and translations for for you know for for the british colonies you know uh, the, the the foreign bible society uh, existed to do this so so mary was kind of the ordinary gal really that just wanted to have the Bible in her hands, just wanted to treasure the Word of God, be able to read it every day. In the book, we actually uh, there, we had there's a picture of um, uh, the table of con, or I think it's one of the table of contents in her Bible. Yes, uh, with a note of how she got it, you know, and 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 uh, the dates on it and all that kind of stuff. So so yeah, Mary's um, Mary kind of shames me in a lot of ways, Henry, <laughs> because I have numerous Bibles in on my bookshelf here, you know, yes. <laughs> and, and, yes. uh, and, and I, and I feel like I, I treasure it less than she does or did. Does that make sense? So yes, wonderful story, super inspiring, but it really got us thinking about how we got the Bible. How can we continue to tell the story of how we got the Bible so that the Marys of the church and the kingdom of God can be inspired to read it more and to have a greater understanding of how we got it. Yeah, it really moved my heart. Uh, I thought it was a great opening. You know, I I felt the same way. I felt a, a minor, maybe small rebuke from the Lord of don't take for granted the time that you live in and the blessing that you have to have access to the Bible in so many, so many ways. How many miles Amen. would you? How many miles would you walk to have a copy of the Bible when you didn't have one? And and that there's people groups in the world that don't have a complete Bible today. You know, that's yes. that's another thing about it. Yes. Well, anyway, Sobering. please, folks, get get a copy of the book and read more about that story. Okay, so you you guys do divide the book into sort of three main sections: text, yes. canon, and translation. Talk about talk about that layout a little bit. Yeah. Uh, very good. So, well, by now, your, your, your audience knows that the Bible doesn't fall out of heaven on a sheet, uh, <laughs> bound between two faux leather covers, and in the English language, okay, for example, uh, the Bible uh, comes to us after a long, arduous history. And this is the story we're trying to tell through those three main blocks, the text of the Bible, 
that part one there focuses on what do we know about ancient writing? What do we know about how ancient Israelite scribes worked and operated? What do we know about ancient literacy in Israel, for example? Or, or what do we know about scribes or, or others learning how to write, you know, maybe learning how to read even. So, so in chapter one of that first part on text, we actually take a deeper dive into the ancient world and look at this whole world of scribes and, and these unsung heroes, they're anonymous, right? Hardly, hardly any names are assigned to them. Yes. Uh, there are a few, but hardly any. And they tell us so much about uh, or they've left behind so much uh, for us to study and research. So chapter one deals with kind of just this whole topic of ancient writing. Then once texts are written, they then become copied and copied and copied and copied. And so we trace that story for the Old Testament in chapter two and for the New Testament in chapter three. And then texts probably weren't immediately thought of as canonical. OK, there was there was another process. Once we had books, once we had copies of books, once those books really became recognized as containing God's voice, so to speak, then we could start talking about how they're authoritative for the Israelite community and then the, later on the church. Right. And uh, and so canon history is the substance of part two. And I, maybe we'll get to this. I don't know. I'll just drop this spice. I mean, the, we go all the way up to the Reformation yeah. with this topic and uh, really parsing out how, the pro, how Protestants got their Old Testament, how Roman Catholics right, have their Old Testament right, as the result of the Council of Trent and so on and so forth. So, and then we have a chapter on the New Testament canon as well. We can talk more about that. But then once, once we've got like a, a text history laid out, a canonical history laid out, right? The specific books that belong in our Bible. We have to deal with the fact that most people don't read the Bible in Hebrew or in Greek or, or the little parts in Aramaic. Most people access the Bible through translation. So part three is titled translation. Chapter seven deals with ancient translation. So there's a whole fascinating history, Henry, about how the Bible was translated into Greek and Latin and, and other le lesser known languages like Coptic yes. and so on. So, so we've got uh, a, a whole chapter devoted to that that goes all the way up to John Wycliffe, who is right translating Latin manuscripts in the 1200s into Old English or Middle English. Yes. Right. So yes. we've got the start then of an English Bible translation history there going on in the, uh, in, the, in the 13th, 14th centuries. And then finally, chapters eight and nine really try to detail the English Bible history as well as what do we do with all the modern translations today? Yeah. Right? This, this is a question that Dr. Gurry and I get uh, anytime we're speaking in churches, what translation's the best one, you know? Yeah. And, uh, Basically, we answer that as whatever one you're reading. That's Ex the best excellent. That's an <laughs> excellent survey. We're just getting started. That's right. Okay, uh, John, you kind of laid out this, the broad scope of the book, which I think was really important. But here, I'm going to I'm going to just going to give you a, a quote from Augustine that sort of is at the end of the book, and it sort of is it builds up to that, and then I'll let you sort of comment on that. So. Uh, you guys quote Augustine here. And by the way, I've read this quote many times and I love it because I think it encapsulates it. So when he's in, in, interpreting scripture, he says, anything in those books which seems contrary to truth, I decide either the text is corrupt. Let's talk about that. The translator did not follow what was really said or I failed to understand it. What a, what a view of, of the broad picture of what you guys are doing in the book. Talk, talk about that. Un, let's unpack what Augustine said there. And, and yeah. of course, we know a lot yeah. more about all that today. Yeah, wonderful. So I think in that section, in the conclusion of the book, we're trying to bring a number of threads together. We have, we have laid out the humanness, the human element, so to speak, of how we got the Bible in all the preceding chapters. Make sure, if you, if you really read one chapter in this book, you must read the conclusion. Okay. That's, that's the one you must read because that's where this is found. So what we're getting at is a posture now. What's our stance towards the, the Bible, the Bible's history, and more importantly, our understanding of it. Okay. So, 
Augustine, I think, leads the way here to say, look, the problem is never with God. <laughs> the problem is never with God. The problem Amen. is never with God's word or his revelation. Rather, the problem could be with sloppy scribes. Okay. Scribes make mistakes. Augustine in, in, the, in the fourth, fifth century was very aware that, not, that his manuscripts did not always agree. Okay. So Augustine leaves that open as a possibility. He then, so the text is corrupt. That means a scribe maybe has made a mistake. Or he's also reading the Bible in Latin translation. So he's uh, really in a situation very close to ours. Most of us read the Bible not in the original languages, right? Probably most of us in this audience read the Bible in English. And so therefore, we need to hold open the possibility that there's something about the word of God that we don't get because it was lost in translation. Okay, that's, that's the second possibility that Augustine gives. And then here's one of the greatest minds of the entire history of the church, humbly admitting and confessing before God himself that perhaps I just failed to understand it. You see, that's, that's, that's a real posture of humility yes. uh, before God and his word. And so maybe a scribe made a mistake. Maybe something was lost in translation. Or maybe the problem is just with me and I can't understand it. And, uh, and, I, and I've failed to understand it. Augustine is famous for another line. I think it's in the book somewhere. We talk about faith seeking understanding. This is a posture of, of believing even while we're seeking to understand the truth of who God is and how he's revealed himself to us through his word. So these are old things, I, uh, old ideas that I wish we could retrieve as Christians. Yeah. And uh, anyhow, so. Yeah, that's, one, that's wonderful. You know, it does remind me too of uh, Jesus didn't talk about translation or scri uh, scribal activity per se, but he did often say to people, have you not read? The, the assumption always is from Jesus when he's teaching scripture is that if there's a problem, it's not the scripture that's the problem. You're the problem. And, yeah, that's exactly right. And, and, you know, that, that's pointed, but, but Jesus, of course, could be very pointed about certain things. And it's, it's to get us to submit our hearts to the authority of the word. It's, he, the word transforms us, we don't change it. And, and that imprint is throughout your book. And that's one of the things I love about it. We're talking about all these different technical yeah. things and they're important, yeah. but it's this yeah. posture coming at the word yes. of God. Now, let's, let's talk about distinction here. You, you also cite C.S. Lewis. I mean, this just made me so happy. Um, you know, the Bible's inspiration was an or extraordinary new event. That means the original author. Yes. Uh, which fed into God's ordinary way of working into the world. And there you're inferring scribal activity. Tell us the theological distinction, because this is super important. Yeah. Yeah. What we're, what we're trying to detail there is that the original inspiration of human authors, so that God had written what he wanted to have written. We call this divine inspiration. It is a miracle, right? The Bible everywhere presents this activity as a one-off, a miracle, okay? And what Lewis is getting at is, you know, this, this is a pattern that we see from the scriptures themselves. So let's take the uh, virgin conception, right? So there's a miraculous pregnancy that occurs in Mary's womb, right? But but after that, as soon as that miracle happens, immediately Mary's body is subject to all the normal human processes, right? That is entailed with a nine month pregnancy, a birthing of Jesus, right? And then a raising of a baby boy, right? So, what's so interesting is that we as Christians know this in so many areas, or, or I think Lewis uses the other example from John 2 how Jesus can turn water into wine. This is, a this is a total miracle. And yet, once that wine is consumed, right, it has all its usual effects upon those <laughs> present at the wedding at Cana. You yes. know? And, so, <laughs> yes. and, and, and I just, I, I think this is so amazing how the miraculous kind of gives way to the ordinary. 
And we have no trouble seeing this in many areas. But when it comes to the Bible, Christians have had a, had some questions about this. And so what we're trying to do there with in terms of the Bible is say, well, there's a miracle of divine inspiration. But then that, that, that writing, that text is then kind of introduced into the ordinary processes of copying human beings, hand copying manuscripts. And, and we're still going to say God superintends providentially over, but, but definitely in a different way, right? Yes. Than he, than he um, inspired the original text. So that's, that's what we're trying to get at there. And Lewis's analogies are perfect, I it think, is. for what we're trying to do. All right. That was great. Okay. Yeah. Now we're going to talk a little bit about uh, the copying of the text. Uh, you have three categories. I'm going to let you explain the categories of copying, and we're going to flesh that out. Go ahead, please. Great. Yeah. So from the data, from the manuscripts, and this, by the way, this would maybe go from both Old, Old Testament manuscripts, New Testament manuscripts. This is just, these are just some general phenomena. We've got conservative copying approaches, free copying approaches, and then something we, we just sort of catch all call careless copying uh, approaches. Okay. What, what we mean by this is that, uh, again, man, scribes are, are hand copying, right? A text in front of them. Okay. There are a number of mistakes that can just happen uh, in the normal process of copying. Okay. And uh, in the book, we, we talk about one from Isaiah 40, uh, verses uh, seven and eight, you know, that one that ends with, but the, but the word of our God remains forever. You know, this famous verse here from Isaiah 40, verse eight. But within that section, we show from one of the famous Dead Sea Scrolls, known as the Great Isaiah Scroll, that the scribe actually skipped all of verse seven. This, this text that begins with, you know, the, the, uh, the grass withers and the flower fades, there's four words in Hebrew. And it's actually a repetition. It, it begins uh, verse eight, and it also uh, begins verse seven. Okay. And uh, what's interesting is that in the great Isaiah scroll, and we actually have a picture of it in the book here. The scribe has skipped from the first instance to the second instance. And if you want to, you know, don't make fun of scribes. You try to copy something by hand and see them, the games that your eyes and mind play with you and just see how many times you do that. Okay. Well, anyways, that's an example of careless copying. Okay. There's no, there's no motive there. There's nothing. It's just a mistake. And we talk about that uh, to some degree. Now, What do we mean? Conservative copying is probably what most of this audience has in mind when they think about a scribe sitting down and copying. So there's probably no need to go into that. But just so you know, there are real, real examples from millennia ago that just snapshot conservative, extremely conservative copying. Okay, letter by letter copying. Okay, and uh, and these were trained scribes, professionals. And they did really, really sound work. Where most of the audience is probably going to have a question or two is this idea of free copying. Yes. Or this I or right, or this idea that maybe a scribe could intervene and do some things that that aren't necessarily reflected in the text he was copying. Okay. That's I think probably where some of us are gonna have some questions. So anyhow, which, which way do you want to go with that, Henry? Well, let's let's uh, just take a couple of minutes yeah. and let's talk about this. Uh, how you know we see variations in the in the Ten Commandments? Maybe give a summary of that. What a scribe did with one section and you put it in another, and yes. you know, yes. critical scholars interpret that as see, there's all these different texts and blah blah blah. But you have a different yeah. you have a different interpretation. Let's let's talk okay. about that. Okay. Yeah, so in, in the book, uh, we talk about a certain Dead Sea Scroll uh, called 4Q Deuteronomy N. By the way, if this, this nomenclature of 4Q, <laughs> it's, it's all very technical. Uh, all we mean is that this scroll, primarily of Deuteronomy chapter uh, 5 and a little bit of 6, was taken from the fourth cave at Qumran on the northwest side of the Dead Sea. Okay, And then 
the, it, it's called Deuteronomy because it's the text of Deuteronomy, but, and then it's got a little N above it that separates it from all the other scrolls of Deuteronomy found in the same cave. So, so don't be turned off by that. That's just a kind of way to reference things. So 4Q Deuteronomy N is a fascinating text. It has been described as a an excerpted text. I'll come back to that in a second. It's also been described as a harmonizing text. And scholars right now, Henry, don't really know exactly what to do with it. They just know that it's a text that's very, very different from copies of Deuteronomy that appear later. Okay, so that's, and, and sometimes uh, scholars might say that this is a so-called non-aligned text. That is, it's got so many unique readings in it, and it doesn't seem to align with anything we, or any other uh, textual examples. So they look at it and they kind of throw their hands up and they go, well, maybe it's just produced at a place where scribes created chaos. Okay. And maybe they, maybe they didn't even know what they were doing. Okay. Like there's, there's all kinds of hypotheses out there about this text. Now, very quickly, it does show what we call excerption. So if you think about Deuteronomy 5, this is mainly where the 10 commandments are found, but this text doesn't begin with Deuteronomy 5. It probably began with Deuteronomy 8 verses 5 through 10. Now, Deuteronomy 8 is this wonderful sermon. Moses is trying to motivate the people to obey the Lord so that, so that when they go in the land, they'll live the blessed life in the land and, and, and obey his word, walk in his ways, all these sorts of things. And so, Deuter so, so some scribe found Deuteronomy 8 verses 5 to 10 a, as a wonderful introduction, you see, to the Ten Commandments in Deuteronomy 5. Now, that sounds really weird to us. We have a certain order of chapters, verses. None Don't. of us would ever think about copying a text that way. Yes, and we wouldn't mess, we wouldn't mess with the text. And that's how, exactly. it, that's how it's interpreted. So yes. uh, it, it could be for a lot of different reasons. Yeah. So, but some scribe thought, let's, let's use Deuteronomy 8, 5 to 10 as an introduction to this. And we don't know why, like definitively, I'm going to give you a, I'm going to give you my best answer to that uh, here in a moment, but, but Deuteronomy 8, 5 to 10 introduces the 10 commandments. It's mo in Deuteronomy 8, Moses is giving the motivation for why the people should obey the Lord and then followed right up with the 10 major ways, the 10 major words for what obedience to the Lord looks like. Okay, so, so that's, that's an example of an excerption where a scribe takes maybe a part of, of, a, of a book, the same book, but a little bit later part, moves it in front. Okay, this is actually some, some rearranging of material going on. This scroll also shows a, a, another free scribal tendency, right? So this is not the conservative copying. This is free copying. And these texts are probably created for different reasons. Within this copy, though, when you get to the Sabbath day commandment, Henry, what's so interesting is that the text reads just like Deuteronomy 5 all the way uh, down to, right, the, way, the, the reason why they're going to keep the Sabbath is because God's going to bring them into the land, right, and, and, and give them the good life there, and they'll have rest, okay, on the seventh day in the land. God brought them out of Egypt. But, but our audience knows that in Exodus 20, the, the first uh, account of the Ten Commandments, there is a remember the Sabbath day, of course. Uh, the command is quite similar, not identical, but quite similar. But a whole different rationale, a whole different reason for keeping it is given in Exodus 20, verse 11. In fact, uh, we're told uh, to keep the Sabbath there because God worked for six days in creation, but rested on the seventh day, you see. So, so between Exodus 20 and Deuteronomy 5, there's a Sabbath commandment, but there's two different reasons. Now, that might not have set well with a particular Jewish scribe, namely the one we're talking about here yes. in 4Q Deuteronomy N. What happens is Exodus 20 verse 11 is added to the Deuteronomy 5 text. The whole verse is simply added. Okay. And to, to us, that, is, that looks like chaos. Now, in the book, Scribes in Scripture, I explain, or we explain that, that there's actually intentionality behind this. We know the scribes left a footprint, uh, a way of marking that he's, re, that he's using text found from earlier 
in the book. Okay, so it's actually actually it's marked off as an intentional addition to the text, but it is meant to harmonize the reasons for keeping the Sabbath. You see, that's why this scribe did it. Now, two comments, two more comments. The best answer to this is that this scroll is a one-off. There are no other copies of it. This is this is a a one-off example. The scrolls seem to be created for what I might call liturgical purposes. So this was read at in, in amongst the Qumran community in a way that packaged the Ten Commandments for community reading. Okay, they took. The very words of Moses from Deuteronomy 8, uh, a sermon given there to Israel, and they actually contextualize the Ten Commandments that way. Only one copy of this do we have, but it seems to have been created for a very specific purpose, a liturgical reading. In fact, we might even go so far as to say it was created for exegesis or interpretation. Okay. Yes. Not it was not intended to be a conservative copy. It was intended to be a biblical text but one that uh, was going to be used for liturgy or commentary writing, okay? Yes. The other comment Excellent. I want to make on this, this is a bit more technical, but the, the, the base text that the scribe of 4Q Deuteronomy N used is probably one that is very, very close to our own Masoretic text or the later Masoretic text, yeah. okay? So what's so fascinating is these, these creative copies are actually based on conservative copies, uh, you see. Yeah, and yeah. We can, yeah, we can actually see how the scribe worked in the way he did it. He must have had a text that looked like, you know, the, the, what we call the later Masoretic text, right? But that has a whole history too. And from that text, he goes on to make his free copy or creative copy of the Ten Commandments. So uh, a free copy actually attests to the conservative text in an indirect way. That's, so that, that, is, that, that's maybe what we should say about that. Yeah, that, no, that's a great tutorial. And I think I'll, I'll just add some summarizing thoughts to it and then we'll move on to our, our next subject. So one is you're, you're trying to address concerns among conservative Christians who think that it's only conservative copying, almost like a photocopy is the conservative model exactly. uh, of, of copying the text. But there were other people that were doing it for other reasons. And it doesn't mean that the text was in this wild state of yeah. fluctuation and, yeah. and that we can't yeah. know what the original text was and all those kind of assumptions that are, that are built into that. Well, that, that, was, exactly. that was a great tutorial. And we, we do urge folks to, uh, to read more about some of those things as we move forward. Now, I want to talk, I want to move to... Old Testament canon. We'll move out of text. Yep. Let's move to canon. Uh, what does canon mean? Uh, you're an expert on this subject. You've written some very technical material yeah. on it. Very briefly, canon is authority. If it means anything, it's authority. So what we're getting at are what books were divinely inspired, uh, what books were recognized as divine authority in the life of the Jewish synagogue, and in the life of the Christian church. That's really good. I, you know, when I first encountered this 15 some odd years ago, I knew there was an answer to it, but I didn't know what the answer was. <laughs> you know, faith, yeah, understanding, yeah. you know, it's interesting. Yeah. And so yeah, the, way, right. the way that you guys have done this and Dr. Uh, Dr. Gentry really put me onto this, mm. uh, mm -hmm. is really helped me. And now I can talk with people about it, you know, so. Yeah. Okay, so what's some of the historical evidence that helps us understand what happened in the past? You've done extensive work on this, so please uh, share with us about it. Yeah, scholars over the years have looked at really four kinds of evidence when they're talking about uh, how the canon came together, okay, that we have. One, one area of evidence um, that, uh, yeah, I guess I know a little bit about are the canon lists, so these are actually lists from uh, early Jews, early Christians. I, I like to explain them as they're the earliest table of contents to the Bible, okay? Uh, because they're actually the titles of the books are, are listed out. These come from individuals like Augustine, whom we talked about earlier, or Athanasius of Alexandria, and, and just numerous figures from church history that we try to expose uh, uh, the, the reader to in the book. So 
but canon lists, I think, is the is the best form of evidence, the clearest form of evidence for what was in the canon. What did someone think was in the canon? Well, let's go and look at the list that they drafted of the books. Okay, so canon list. There are other ancient statements. So scholars have made much of statements like Jesus's when he says, uh, I did not come to abolish the law and the prophets, but rather I came to fulfill them. You see in Matthew 5. Well, what's meant by law and prophets? This, this phrase has garnered so much debate over decades here, I would say. The law is pretty clear, seems like the first five books of Moses, but it really comes down to what it was meant by prophets there, okay? And we don't have time to delve into that, but we, we do say some things about that. The other form of evidence that has really come into the spotlight is ancient manuscripts, Henry. And and why not, right? We just spent so much time talking about 4Q, Deuteronomy, N, and, and, and all of these things. They're so fascinating, right? ABR knows so much about this. We, we, find, we, we discover these things in caves, you know, yes. in the dirt, so to speak. I mean, it's, it's unbelievable, right? Manuscripts are amazing, and they fascinate us, and they captivate us, and they should. The problem is, is that scholars now are talking about canon, authoritative books, when they analyze manuscript information. And this leads to all kinds of problems okay. because manuscripts can't reflect a canon. They reflect maybe reading habits, okay? Books that are important to a certain community. But let me give you an example. And let's use the New Testament for an example. The famous Codex Sinaiticus, right? Contains the, the complete 27 book New Testament canon. This is from the fourth century. Amazing discovery by Tischendorf, etc. But what most people don't know is that Codex Sinaiticus also contains the Epistle of Barnabas and the Shepherd of Hermas after our book of Revelation. Like it contains two extra books. Yeah. Now we got to answer. Now we got to ask. Why is that? Are those two books in the canon because they're in a manuscript? even an important manuscript yeah. like Codex Sinaiticus. Yeah. And my answer to that is no, because when you start to compare and contrast these different evidences, the Shepherd of Hermas, for example, is never found in a single Christian canon list. It is always talked about as a significant book, an important book, but no father of the church ever lists the Shepherd of Hermas as a canonical book. I think that's really interesting. It is. Uh, so, and so, so I don't think Codex Sinaiticus should be used to say someone thought these two books were in the canon. It just doesn't make sense because I would expect that book to show up in other lists, and it never does. Okay. Uh, in other words, manuscripts might show what a book, what books are popular. Manuscripts definitely show what books uh, people are reading, but it can't show and doesn't show what books people thought were authoritative, where God was speaking to them. You see. Uh, in an inspired kind of way. So manuscripts, getting lots of press, but I think canon scholars uh, are continuing to sort out what exactly they tell us about the canon. Scripture quotations. Uh, so right in the New Testament, we see all these citations and quotations of books of the Old Testament, right? Uh, Jesus quotes, right? Like, as it has been fulfilled, or as it has been spoken, right? Matthew might say, so it's been fulfilled. Filled, right? He's speaking about Hosea 11, 1 or something like this. Scripture quotations can tell us about which books an author thought were scriptural. Uh, we need to be careful about how much they might tell us about what an author thought about the canon. Okay, we need to be careful about that because uh, some books just simply aren't quoted. Uh, I was teaching in my class last night on the Song of Songs. Song of Solomon has, is never quoted in the New Testament. Right, but right. Does that mean Je but does that mean Jesus and the apostles never thought or, or didn't think about the book as scriptural, right? Probably not, but because it's not quoted, we don't, we don't really know, right? So, it's, it's, so there are some open questions there if we're just going to hold or, or use scripture quotations to establish a canon. So those four pieces of evidence uh, are super important uh, for how we, how we reconstruct the history of the canon. Canon lists are the clearest of that evidence. That history begins for the Hebrew canon with the, Jew, the Jewish historian Josephus. He talks about how the Jews have only ever had 22 books that are divinely inspired. Okay, Most scholars today think that the 22 books Josephus refers to are the 22 books of the Hebrew canon. 
Okay, and, and, and there's really no deviation there. So by 100 AD, there's a pretty set number of books. The canon is right. closed. Yeah. And Christian, early Christians in the second century, when they start to draft lists, follow in Josephus's footsteps. Not identically, but they do follow in his footsteps. Christians, uh, the, the Old Testament canon for Christians is trying to mirror the Hebrew canon, right? And we actually, in the book, we call this the Hebrew canon criterion, right? If the Jews had accepted those books, were reading those books in their synagogue, then the church was also going to accept and read those books. Now, the, the issue, Henry, is not all Christians agree on the right. criteria. Right. We talk about this in the book. Right. Uh, so our friend Augustine would actually hold a slightly different opinion of how to discern the canon. Okay. He would say, well, no, shouldn't it be left up to the, which, book the, which books the churches are reading and accepting, not, what the, not which books the synagogue is reading and accepting. Okay. So, so I, we call this the criteria crunch. There's a, there's a bit of conflict there. And, um, so many, in fact, most church fathers would be on the side of the Jewish or Hebrew canon criterion, but there were a handful of fathers that argued, uh, no, the church should decide these things. Excellent. So, so that's the debate. All right. Well, I just want to add my own thoughts on that, and it is that uh, a lot of what we read in the literature about canon is that it was the mind and will of man that decides canon. But it's God inspired a certain corpus of books, and we receive and accept that canon. And the fact that the church disagrees about it, well, we disagree about all kinds of doctrines, baptism, uh, you know, whether you can be, uh, per- if you're permanently saved, all kinds of questions about election and all those kind of things. So uh, the fact that we disagree doesn't mean there isn't a fixed set of books that God right. has given to us. That's right. And okay. I think you agree with that. You know, oh, for sure. M- Michael Kruger made an interesting thing. He said, When did the New Testament canon close? Well, technically it closed when the ink on the last word in Revelation was drying. That's interesting, right? And and he's right about that. But how we discovered that is a different different story. Well, yes. And I think that's, Mike and I have so much agreement, but we do. We have little, little squabbles about those kinds of things. Yeah, yeah. But I think, yeah. Yeah. yeah, on the main, we're we're in agreement. Yeah, sure. I don't know if you saw this gospel coalition uh, coming up this September, um, I'm giving a talk on the OT canon, and Mike is in our micro event oh, giving great. a talk on the New Testament. Okay, so all right, um, let's let's talk a little bit about New Testament canon. Uh, you talk about old. Let's talk about new. So talk about. Could you t- share with us about like an example of Andy Stanley for an example? So, uh, how misunderstood the idea of canon is, and I think it picks up on the idea that we talked about in the last yeah. end of the last segment. Please yeah. go with that. Yeah, let's let's run with some of this. Um, when you're talking about canon, it, for whatever reason, it becomes the topic of conspiracy. Okay, uh, and I think we can actually start to date where where that idea came from. It didn't come from the the scholarly halls of Oxford or Cambridge, or or even UNC Chapel Hill. Okay, where 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 this idea, this notion of a conspiracy around the canon came from, is actually from Dan Brown's Da Vinci Code. Yeah, which last time I checked was uh, had sold over eighty three million copies since it was published in the early 2000s. Is that right? Uh, and, and then it was made into a massive film, right? With Tom Hanks starring in it. And, uh, you know, up until a few years ago, I had never watched that movie, but I thought, you know, I better go check it out just to see which lines from the book actually end up in the movie. And you'll, and, and if, you've, if, if the audience has read the book or seen the film, then you know that there's this scene in, that, in the way Dan Brown tells this story about how um, Teabing, I think, he talks about how there were 80-something Gospels that, that were in the Bible, but that a later council, like at Nicaea in 325 AD, uh, removed from the Bible and left us with only four Gospels, you see. But there were 80 Gospels, and they all should have been in the, in the Bible, and they were in the Bible at one point until a very small group of church leaders called bishops 
gathered and removed them all, you see. <laughs> now, this is the narrative. Yes, yes. That is out there. It, uh, Henry, it is in the air. Like people would, might say, well, I don't have an opinion on that, but but wasn't there something about all these other gospels and they they don't even know where they get the idea from anymore? But it's actually from Dan Brown. You you can go on social media, Twitter, and that, those ideas are just everywhere. Yeah, in the um, air, they are in the air. That's true. They're in the air. Yeah, yeah. And, and people don't even know why they think that anymore because scholars aren't teaching that. Professors at most universities aren't teaching that. Dan Brown has taken an idea and he's he's blown it up. He's put it on a massive scale. Okay, so so that's one thing we're up against here is the the sheer misinformation. So so in my next example, we talk uh, or we, we could talk about the uh, evangelical pastor Andy Stanley. He's made some controversial statements over the years about the Bible, but but one that he makes uh, that that we pick up on is this whole idea that the Bible wasn't created until the fourth century, and it was created as a process of selection. So around 336, he actually, unfortunately, he can't even get the date of Athanasius correct, okay? That's 367 for those keeping track, okay? <laughs> but Andy associates Athanasius in 336, which is a, just a factual error. But he starts to make all kinds of comments about how the books of the Bible of the New Testament were selected. Some brought in, others left out, and he makes it a fourth century creation. Well, I think, I don't, I'm not sure how widespread that idea is, but this idea of selection though, like there was a bunch of eligible books and Christian leaders just picked and choose which ones they wanted and left the rest. Okay. That's wrong. Okay. We have a canon of scripture primarily due to a fancy word called tradition. Okay. Right. And in particular, we have a canon because of apostolic tradition. OK, in fact, one of the criteria is that a book must uh, that, that uh, wound up in the canon, the New Testament canon must have been written by an apostle or a close associate of an apostle. Right. OK. And um, but and Andy is sort of trading off this idea. Well, no, no, it was just kind of a willy nilly selection process. But but just as an example, Henry, it does seem that we have a closed four gospel collection. Right, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, by at least by at latest 180 A.D. Right. Okay, with the statements of of a guy named Irenaeus. Okay. Yes. And uh, there, the evidence for that is so strong that that to say that we that that there were you know, all these gospels vying for that position is really a misnomer, and we need to squelch that idea. Yes, there were lots of other gospels. But the debate is about, did anyone seriously think that they were going to be in the universal canon for the church? And that's, that's the hard thing to prove. Uh, probably not. The other thing I will say on this issue is um, if you have questions about these other gospels, go read them. I do encourage people to read them. Uh, if you want to jump right to something very, very spicy, go to the very end of the Gospel of Thomas. Okay, where the disciples are having a discussion with Jesus about whether Mary Magdalene can become a disciple. And the answer that comes off of the Jesus, Jesus's lips of the Gospel of Thomas is so shocking. <laughs> like you have to read it a few times. Did I read that right? Yes. yes. He, suge he suggests, no, not suggests, he says, well, we can make Mary male. Is that right? Man. Yes. Yeah. And then she can become a disciple and enter the kingdom of God or something like this. It is so shocking. And the reason why I'm glad it's shocking is because I, we know the Jesus of the four gospels who would never say anything like that. Of course. Okay. Of course. Okay. So go ahead and read them. There's some talking crosses involved in the, in, in some of these gospel, the gospel of Peter, you know, I mean, Very there's some really yes. interesting and strange things. Yeah. Um, and you can see why. Um, you can see why a, 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 a single community might write such a thing, but you can also see why I, the vast, vast majority of Christians never thought about them as authoritative or canonical. Okay. Yes. That's a great example. Um, yeah. Really good. That was interesting. That gospel of, uh, that gospel of Thomas, Thomas. stuff. Yeah. That's oh, the, yeah. you know, that's the, okay. 
you know, that's the subjective part of it. We didn't talk about that. But, you know, there is the working of the spirit in the life of the believer yep. that, you exactly. know, my, this, you know, this shepherd yep. speaks and hears the voice, sheep know my voice, that kind of thing. Amen. Amen. So we can't, we can't yep. discount that. And scholarship completely right. discounts that. Exactly. You know, exactly. Yeah, yep. no, that's right. So what Very I will good. say is, first of all, thanks for coming on the show. You, yes. It's just excellent. I would encourage folks to pick up a copy of the book. If they want to find out about the history of English translation, your colleague, Peter Gurry, is more of yes. the expert on that. Uh, it's yes. laid out in here why we can trust translations and so forth and so on. And folks, That's right. uh, so, so John, thank you so much for this great work. Uh, I really enjoyed the book. I appreciate all your scholarship and give my thanks to Dr. Gurry as well. Mm, will do. Thanks, thanks so much, Henry. There's a lot more that's in the book that we didn't get a chance to talk about today. The book, again, is called Scribes and Scripture, The Amazing Story of How We Got the Bible. And you can find it on crossway.org or Amazon or wherever you get your books. That's all we have for today. Until next time. Digging for Truth is a presentation of the Associates for Biblical Research. To find out more about ABR, just go to BibleArchaeology.org.